I wanted to talk about my daughter, Hazel. This might be a little long-winded. I'm not going to edit this, so forgive me for rambling. But my wife and I, we found out that we were pregnant this last September. And we had, which we just had a miscarriage a couple months ago. So the realization that things might not work out was very, very real for us. Um, the miscarriage over the summer, we were about seven weeks along and it was pretty, pretty tough. So the moment that we found out that we were pregnant with our daughter, Hazel, we got real nervous. We didn't get too excited. We just kind of waited to see what might happen until we got to at least the, uh, 12 weeks mark, something like that. And at about that point, when we got to go and actually see the heartbeat, that was a really, really exciting moment for us. Because all of a sudden, this felt real. It was real before, but this just kind of, um, th- th- it was it for us. We just, we were in love right off the bat. And week after week, Taylor got to feel more kicking more activity and it was and it was really cool she would she would tell me hey come over here and feel this and immediately statue baby the moment the dad touches she's not moving but I just kind of told myself you know what that's fine I'll wait till she gets here it'll be worth the wait and at about week 36 my wife had my wife had an appointment and she went in she, and everything seemed fine and so she came home today had my appointment everything looks good no big deal but then that day that same day just a number of hours later she realized i haven't felt hazel move in a couple hours. Maybe she had been, but I'm just not feeling it. I haven't, I don't remember it. I don't remember the last time that it happened. It must've been three o'clock. And at this point it was the evening. So we just said, okay, that's fine. Uh, The doctor says that um, she's, she is supposed to kick, give or take 10 times within a given hour. So we'll just wait, we'll count the hour and we'll see what happens from there. So sat down, watched some TV, just killing time, and nothing ha- nothing happened. We didn't feel anything. So we will, we went over to the ER, and from there, they they took us into the room. The nurse came in. I sat down on the seat over on on the side because t- we we were just we were thinking this. We're freaking out about nothing. You just need to relax and. But then the nurse came in and started checking for a, a heartbeat, and she wasn't getting anything. She said, uh, well, I don't want to get you guys nervous because um, I'm just not, I'm not the best at this. Let, let me go get the doctor and give her a shot. And after the, the doctor who had, she had been doing a, uh, a C-section at the time, she came in and she took a chance to see if she could figure out what was going on. And we could see the little thing on the screen. And we um, we eventually saw that she had she was looking directly at Hazel and looking directly at this little circular P right where her chest is and it wasn't moving. And it was in that moment that we had the unfortunate news that our little girl was not going to be born alive. So, in that moment, my wife, my wife and I, we, we both, we experienced this very differently. I, I just kind of stared at the screen and I didn't 
move. I didn't react. It was, it felt very surreal. And my wife, she, she just started wailing. She was just, you know, she was having a hard time just, you know, why, why us, why? And then we were told that we would need to go, uh, we were given the option to, um, just expedite the, the birth and get this thing taken care of. So that's exactly what we did. We went ahead and decided that we would just start this as soon as we could. And before we wanted to contact our jobs to let them know that we wouldn't be in the next day, we knew that we wanted to talk to our family. And so called my parents, called her parents, and we just kind of, we listened to them cry as well. Um, I say as well, um, but really after those calls, we let them know and they all, they said that they were going to come up the next day because we told them just to stay where they were. Um, but we just kind of looked at each other and we were jealous because we were in shock. So we had not cried at all. We weren't crying. We were just sitting there. Uh, you know, she was wailing, but no tears. I had no tears. We just, it felt, um, I don't know. We don't know what it felt like. So after they came in, they got us situated and we kind of, we knew the plan. We knew what was going to happen. And they, uh, uh, they started a, uh, and this, this all started at 10 o'clock at night. So about uh, midnight, they started a medication that would uh, start contractions to start getting this thing going. And then that would be something that they would administer every six hours just to really, um, just to get this thing going. And once they left and my wife and I had the chance to just really sit there with ourselves, we just, that's when we lost it. We, we weren't able to sleep at all that night. We just, without conscious thoughts, we were just sitting there. We were crying. We were upset. We... Um, like I said before, there's just no conscious thoughts. It was just, this is, this isn't real. We're going to wake up from this thing. It's not actually, this isn't the world we're living in. This has to be a dream. This is so unreal. And unfortunately for us, it, it was very, very real. And that night, I don't know if I've ever felt closer to my wife and the same with her and me. It's being in that circumstance, just the intensity and just the reality of what you're going through. There's only one other person who's in that same boat as you. And we loved each other and wanted each other to be okay, despite the fact that we were just handling this very differently. Um, I was initially in shock. Shock came a little bit later for her. And I really just took on the intense, uh, the intense emotions right off the bat. So that night, I, I didn't realize it was possible to cry as much as I did. I was crying constantly. It would be, I might kind of have a moment, but then I just break down even more. Eventually, like I, I just I laid on the hospital bed right next to her, and we slept for. Um, I slept for probably five minutes. She got thirty minutes of sleep, but that was that was it that night. Um, that was it. And by the time six a.m. rolled around, every thirty minutes, even we would just think, "Is that all the time that's passed?" Because by the time the sun was coming up, I swear, we had to have been there for three or four days. Just time moved so slowly. Every single moment, we just we just soaked in those moments. And on one hand, I was devastated. But at the same time, I knowing there was nothing I could do, I, I did find uh, 
maybe uh, a little bit of solace knowing that I am experiencing these intense emotions because I love my daughter so much. I didn't realize that at the time, but I just, even though we'd never met face to face, the most I've ever had was a couple little kicks here and there. And, and I loved her more than words could ever express. But it was at 6 a.m. that we just kind of gave up and we, were, we realized we're just going to, we're awake. There's no use even trying to sleep. And since Taylor was going to be going through what she was, she was only able to have some uh, jello and things like that. And they were asking me, hey, do you want any food? And I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't eat anything. Um, my wife would have some jello. I would have, um, like a bite or two just for the sake of flavor, but I just, I couldn't eat. My wife's family came in. We spoke to, with them for a little bit. Uh, there wasn't much to say. And the same thing when they left and my family came in, just wasn't much to say. We just kind of sat there and just kind of waited for the next thing. Um, my family, I feel like we mostly just sat there pretty quiet watching on the screen as her contractions took place. Um, she had, a, she had an epidural, so that, that made things, um, that made things quite a bit better for us because we couldn't be strong emotionally, let alone like the physical piece of it. And so after after um, quite a bit of time, we um, it rolled around to being um, six thirty-five. Um, before that, you know, she started pushing. She did the whole thing. We did the whole process, and my little girl was born, not breathing, without a heartbeat, at six thirty-five on May 19th. She was six pounds, um, eight ounces. And as she was going through that process and she was pushing, I, I felt like a failure as a husband because she was doing all of this work. She was, she was pushing, she was doing this stuff. And I was just sitting there like unable to control myself. I was just sobbing because I, we knew that given the circumstances, given that there was a miscarriage, which at this point we, we, and we still don't know, we didn't know then um, what happened, but we didn't know what she was going to look like. We didn't know if there was going to be something obviously wrong that we wouldn't have known about, but eventually Hazel came through and they held up our little girl. And it was the most perfect thing I'd ever seen in my life. People would always say, you know, this this is my baby. She's so beautiful. And I would just look at it and think, I'm glad you like it. It's cute, I guess. Little alien people <laughs> that in a couple months they'll look, you know, more human. But no, my, my daughter, she was everything that I hope she could be in more. She, the, and they took her, they cleaned her up, they put some clothes on her and we let our family know that, you know, she's alive now. She's not alive. She's born. She's not alive. And they went over, they, uh, they cleaned her up, they brought her back to us, and they, they brought out something called the, uh, the cuddle cot, which it's, um, it's a bassinet with a cooling pad on the bottom to help maintain the integrity uh, of our little girl. So we would be able to have the autopsy and the, the testing done once we had the time to really spend with her. And...
So that's kind of all we did. We just we held her and we sobbed. And we just couldn't believe that we created something that was this beautiful. She was everything I would ever want. Even um, I took a, I brought this in here. For years, I made fun of my wife for having a, the the toe next to her big toe was longer than her own toe. And we realized that Hazel had the same thing. And that was a feature I always made fun of my wife for. But the moment I saw that, all I could think is this is, every piece of this is perfect. I couldn't change anything. And fortunately for us, um, I didn't know this was a thing, but there's an organization called Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. And what they do is for free, they come and they take um, baby pictures of babies that that are uh, that are in the same circumstances, Hazel. And I I really wasn't sure what to expect. And they asked us, "Would you like this?" And we're like, "I don't know. That it, it seems strange. I don't know." But ultimately, we decided if we don't have it and we want it, then no harm, no foul. But if we end up not having them and we would have wanted them we would be devastated. So we told him, yeah, we want to do that. And we just waited. We, we held her. We, we touched her face and everything. And like the softest, I, didn't, I don't think I've ever felt anything as soft as her cheeks. They're just so soft. And we later... Um, had um, my friend Father Michael come in to see her and it was around the same time that uh, that the Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep person had come in and I have to say that her name was Sammy she she was really special she she did a really good job she, she came in at, at 10pm because apparently she had been at a uh, another shoot somewhere else earlier in a town about an hour south of us, and she was told about this, and they and it was a situation where they said, "Hey, could you come and do this tomorrow?" And she said, "No, I'm not going to do this tomorrow. She'll look, she's going to look the best today, so I'm going to go today." So even knowing she she was in a, she was doing a shoot an hour south of us, and she lived. 40 minutes south of that place. She came up at 10 o'clock and stayed until 11 something and just took pictures. And I really didn't know what to expect, but she did a really good job. And that, and the, so the pictures that we've, we've only got a couple back so far because we wanted to have some available for the funeral and they look great. They look really great. Because, you know, before we're sitting there, we're looking at her and, you know, she, it's, since there's no blood flow, there's no anything like that, just, there's not really any muscle tone. So even just finding the best way to lay her down so she looked peaceful was kind of difficult, but she knew exactly what she was doing. She brought, she brought in her lights. She, she, just watching her hold this baby was, it was powerful. It was big. And after all things are said and done, we couldn't be any happier with how things turned out because our beautiful baby girl, we got to see those images. We got to preserve those moments in time in a way that most people don't. So um, I'll include a link in the description because this organization, like I said, is free. 
and we we could afford it, but a lot of people can't. So we Taylor and I decided we would make a thousand dollar donation to this organization. And um, if you can, I would love for you to uh, do the same. But so we after this we held on to her and we just held each other, cried. And at about I want to say one o'clock in the morning, we we told the nar- we told the nurse, "Hey, um, it's time for her to go." And so we so the nurse came in. They they wheeled her out and the time we spent with that with our little girl I will hold dear forever and fortunately my uh, my grandmother she used to work at a funeral home so she was in connections with people so getting the funeral set up for her it went pretty smoothly and uh, sorry notification here So then we, we the next day, which fortunately I, I had my sleeping pills that night, and I, I got the uh, medically induced three hours of sleep that night. So then we went over the next morning. We went to the, um, as soon as we got dismissed, we went over and at about, I guess it was one o'clock, we met over at the funeral home and we, Went over everything, and it 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 felt so wrong. I never felt like I would need to be. Um, I never felt like I would be <sighs> making those decisions at my age for my child. So we went through. We um, and when I was there, uh, Father Michael called me and talked about you know all the details and. There wasn't much that we needed to do. I just knew that for the funeral, as far as the arrangements, there was a song called Pie Yezu that I had said for years to my wife that when I die, I want this played at my funeral. And I, and I always thought, I want this played at my funeral, and it was strange to think that I'm making a decision for this thing, This, this one of my most favorite songs of all time. I, I made that decision that I wanted this played at my funeral. But I would never hear that come to fruition. And my daughter, I had to... Um, I made this decision for her. And so whenever, when I spoke with Father Michael about arrangements, I told him um, I would like the song played, if possible. And... He's like, okay, uh, this, the person that we'll have play, we'll see if she can learn it, which I, I didn't have high hopes because, as the name kind of implies, it's Latin. It's Pia Jesu, qui tollis peccata mundi, dona eis requiem. Pious Jesus, you take away the sins of the world, grant us rest. But then we went back to the, once I hung up the phone, we w- I walked back into the room and Taylor Taylor was talking to the um, um, the owner of the funeral home. He, I don't think he's he's the owner anymore, but I can't I don't know what his role would be. But I sp- we spoke to him and we were looking at the casket, which this big, twenty four inches wide. And he talked about people getting pallbearers and everything. And I just kind of disappeared for a little bit as soon as he was talking about that. And then he stepped out of the room to go get uh, some ideas for the, uh, the pamphlets for the funeral. And I knew in that moment that despite how terrifying the idea would be, I'm going to carry my little girl 
down the aisle. I'm never going to be, I'll never get to walk her down the aisle at her wedding or anything like that. I'm never going to get to show her how strong her dad is. So this is my one shot. I'm going to, so, made sure that this, that the casket wasn't something that I couldn't handle because I, I, no matter how hard this was going to be, I told myself, I'm going to do this. So, so we let him, we let the guy know and he said, yeah, that'll be fine. It's, it's light. You can do that. And then the next couple of days, just, it's, it's, as of today, it's been a week, but it's, it feels like it's been three or four, just time runs together and, you know, um, I had some, had some family around, uh, spent some time with them. Um, and, you know, they, they lost something too. They lost a niece. They lost a granddaughter, but I even, I still don't feel like I was there. And at this, at this point, my wife, she, while she was having a difficult time, I I definitely t- had a much harder time right then. Um, mostly because I just being the person that I am, I'm if I'm watching a movie, I am engaged. If I am listening to music, I am engaged. If I'm in a conversation, I am engaged. I'm somebody who just if something is there, I am entirely in it. And that meant that in this moment, I was entirely in this grief. I felt everything and I wouldn't change it for the world because that was me loving my daughter. So after some time went by, just a couple days, we it, it rolled around to Friday where we had the funeral. And oh, before I get to that point, the way how I was handling grief, there were a couple things I was just very, very fixated on. Number one was, I'm going to carry my daughter. The other part was, for whatever reason, I want to look good for her. For years, I'd been wanting to get a suit. I'd been putting it off, and I just, I kept putting it off, putting it off, and then um, Friday morning, I went over uh, with my brother and we went to a, a store and we picked up the suit. I price tags irrelevant. It I just I found exactly what I wanted and I was going to buy that. I was going to wear that. And I don't know why that was so important for me, but for whatever reason, it was the most important thing in the world for me that I look good for her. So And my wife, she looked, she looked wonderful as well. It. So we went over to the, to the, uh, went to the church, went through all the stuff. They, we had all these flowers, and. So we went in early, and we. They wrote all all the the cards off to us. And. Um, my wife's friend from when she was in high school, I think today she went to prom with them. That Thursday, he was ordained as a deacon, and he and he contacted us and asked if he could participate in our daughter's funeral, and that was a very, very special thing for Taylor, and it was special to me. And of course, like I said, Father Michael, he was involved in all this, and he's a good friend, so I'm glad that of anybody who would, um, you know, lead the mass at her, at her funeral, that it could be a friend. And that meant a lot. So we went in and after a little bit of time, you know, people started funneling in and we, we didn't know what to do. So we, we were off to the side. We, we didn't want, we knew we wanted to talk to people, but we knew we just really couldn't right then. So we decided, 
we would move into the adoration chapel and there's uh, we went in and there was two people in there already we just sat off to the side and uh, the woman who's sitting there um, after we were there for about we just sat in silence for 15 minutes just waiting and then the woman there said hey um, can I ask whose funeral this is because I would like to pray for their family. So we told her, it, it, it's ours. It's, it, it's our stillborn little girl. And that's, and immediately she just reached over and she started f like fumbling through her uh, purse and said, hey, well, in the Magnificat, which, um, long story short, it's these biblical readings and things like that that they s would send out regularly she said, well, th I, this was uh, this was written in a Magnificat this past week, and I wanted you to have it. So she tore it out and handed it to us, and it was about dealing with loss of specifically a child. And that, I don't even remember what it said, just, yeah, just the circumstances were, it, it meant a lot to us. I don't know the lady's name. She, I don't think she knows our name, and I don't think she will, but... That was, that was a very special moment. And then afterwards, we loaded up, or we got all the people inside, and we got together. And, and then they were playing music, and it was a moment that went right back to me carrying my daughter because it was like the moment that, I, if the closest thing I could have to walking her down the aisle. So we stood in the back. I said, everybody turn towards the back. And that's the moment when I, I reached out and I picked up her casket to walk her down the aisle. Without a doubt, it is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I, I was wearing a mask because of COVID-19 and I'm glad I was because I don't even want to know what my face looked like. I making sounds I'd never made in my entire life. I was just sobbing the entire way, just thinking the entire time, just thinking I've got you. We're going to do this. And I brought her up to the front put her down and and we were seated my brother did the readings and as a kid I remember thinking mass takes so long it's it's 45 minutes in the mind of a child it's so long we're here forever but the entire event just flew by unbelievably quick and And we went up for communion. And I received, I went back to my seat, and that's in the moment that I realized that there wasn't any singing, but they found an arrangement for Pia Yezu. And that was really, really special to me. It just, I did. It was very, very powerful. And from that moment on, I don't I don't really know what happened. I just time went by and they started playing music and I knew that it, it was the exit song. So I, I I walked back up and I carried my little girl out of the church. Which I should never no parent should ever walk their daughter down the aisle and have to walk her back. And, and we had made the decision that we were going to, we wanted to drive her to the cemetery. And we were going to have it in my hometown, but the church was so small that we, we knew we needed more space. But we were still going to bury her in that same cemetery. So 
for us, we ended up with the opportunity of my wife sat in the passenger seat. She buckled up. And I put the casket on her lap. And then I stepped into the car and then we just, we just sobbed. We just lost it. It was really, really hard. And we just, we followed the hearse there. And up at this point, this, it was the worst day of my life. The worst day. But my wife and I, one thing we we did a lot, whenever we would have like vacations, we, we rarely did the whole, we're going to go to like a resort and do all this stuff. And that's just not something we really did. We had, but that wasn't the norm for us. We were more weekend trip type people. We would relax together. We would hop in a car, just cruise. And on our honeymoon, that's all we did is we got in the car. We drove to, we drove to Kansas City. We had a good time there. We drove uh, to um, Arkansas, spent time there, and just without a plan, just it was just us in the car, and that was something we had. So this, after we started driving, you know, we, we didn't talk a whole lot right in the moment. We just played the new Josh Garrels album, which was it had become the soundtrack to our grieving. And we just enjoyed our time as a family. We just drove for the 30 minutes on a day when it was supposed to be, it was, I'd heard it was supposed to be rainy. It was supposed to be all this stuff, but it, it, the weather was wonderful and the sky was beautiful. And we just, we got to drive. We just followed the hearse those 30, 35 minutes to the cemetery. And that drive without a doubt is the best 30 minutes of my life. The chance that we had to spend with our little girl, I would never trade away for anything. And that 30 minute drive felt so short, but it was everything to me and it was everything to my wife. So by the time we got to the cemetery, crying was done. We, I was so happy that I'm, I'm assuming it made some of the people at the, at the cemetery uncomfortable because they didn't, they don't know about the moment that we had. They don't know that we had the experience of, of having our family time that we always had. So we showed up. And everyone gathered around, and we we had all these helium balloons, and we passed them all out to everybody. And then all together, we just let them go. I remember whenever my wife, it was her idea, and when I told her, because when she told me, she said, I know it's going to sound corny, but we should do this. In my mind, I was thinking, yeah, it's corny. It's super corny. But I love that we did that. Whatever it meant, I don't know. But that moment was significant that we all, it was like the, the final goodbye. So, Then we went home and we spent some time with some friends, spent some time with some family. And I kind of felt like, yeah, we're going to cry every day for a while. That's, that's how it's going to be. We're going to cry every day. And that's just how it is. And like I said before, my grief was very intense 
and things lightened up quite a bit afterwards. But my wife, it's 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 going to be a long drawn out process, and it's going to be really hard. And I know it's going to be the little things that just really set us off. So we had a, she had a, uh, one of my wife's cousins came over, brought her four year old son. It was nice to you know have the distraction. And we looked over, and we were just. She was talking to him, and I was looking over at him and following him around the house. And then he stepped over and said, "Hey, whose room is that?" I said, "That's that's Hazel's room." She said, "Where is she?" And I. I just told him he's she's not here. I was like, where is she? And I didn't say anything. I think I might have said it's it's hard to explain, and then I just kind of walked away, and that was that. It, it's gonna be difficult, and I don't know when, if or when it's gonna get any easier. So. Ultimately, things will be better. But the thing that's interesting about the whole experience is a lot of people, when they go through things like this, they would say something along, something along the lines of, why would God do this? Why would, why would he kill our child? Why would he do this thing? And there were some people, even at the funeral, that said things like, I don't know why God does this. And... That wasn't really a difficulty for me because that's bad theology. The reality is anything that is good is of God. Anything that is, anything, any blessing that you receive is of God, whether you know it or not. Whether that be an atheist who's having a good day or whatnot, that's, that's the, that's a gift. That's the, that's a grace. That's a blessing. So looking at everything, just the realization that in the book of Job, you know, he'll let, he'll, he'll, he will let things happen that are not good, but those things are not of his doing. So for whatever reason, he blessed us with the opportunity of 36 weeks of our child living within my wife and blessed us with the opportunity to be able to hold our little girl as small as amount of a time as it was that we had. It was a blessing that we would never trade away for anything. I know this is a little strange because I don't have a, a way to end this. I just know that I that we wanted to put this out here because people were given some details on uh, what actually happened, like the loss, but this is the full story. And someday we, we want to meet her again. So... Pray for us, pray for our family. And if you've got kids, go hug them, love them. And thank you for watching.